Hi, Kim. Hey. Summer, I just, I just sent you a message. Who? Nate just sent me a message. About what? Engineering. Engineering? It's going to Oh, right. Okay. Peter Kofinas, Brian Fenner, Robert Hugh. Hi, Peter. Pal Sikachun. It's not pronounced Shrikachorn, people. It's Sikachun. I asked. I got the original Thai correct pronunciation. I love you, pal. I'm going to wave to you. Robert, I'm going to wave to you. Brian, I'm going to wave to you. Peter, I'm going to wave to you. Gerard, I'm going to wave to you because there's no kiss. Otherwise, I'd kiss you right on the lips. Dan Klein. Awkward. Charlie Cho. <laughs> Robert Hughes. Sundar BJJ. Choke out Charlene for me, please. That's messed up, Rob. She heard that. You want to say something? Um, Rob, you can talk shit when uh, you learn how to pass the guard. Yeah. Hey, Charlie Frank is here. <laughs> Brita Dorotamico is here. The Atomic Smasher. You see Charlie Frank there in the comments? Charlie's one of my blue belts from Pennsylvania. He lives in the mountains and he trains all these people secretly in his garage. He's got like a ninja assassin thing happening there. And he's got the nickname Atomic Smasher because he's a big dude and he just lays on you and you die. It feels like you're being crushed by atomic weight. But the, actually the reason we're doing this today is because Charlie reached out and said, Sundar, let's do the baseball choke series. And I was like, Charlie, that's a great idea. So that's what we're gonna do. I got the Adam Lynn rash guard today. I don't know what it is, I can't see. Some kind of anime demon. I don't it's a cool. do anime, but it's a good uh, Kamara. Oh, Johnny Utah's here. Cool combat skins rash guard um, gift from my best friend, Adam Lynn. Jen Utah, I'm gonna wave to you because I can't kiss you right on your lips, <laughs> but I would if you were here. Okay, so Charlene's gonna have her head toward the camera. Oh, yeah. And I'll just move back a little, like a little closer to the camera so we get some. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. A shrimp. Yeah, did you see that? That's called a shrimp for you people who don't train. <laughs> Teach her some real jujitsu because she thinks she knows jujitsu and she really doesn't. How did you know it was wrong? Because <laughs> he's a turd. <laughs> <laughs> move over like a little bit. Okay, right there. Cool. So when I have an individual on their back and I am on top of them and fully straddling their body, that is called the mount position. I've purchased a lot of real estate here. I have one hand and one leg on each side. We have to move back more. We're out of camera already. And I'll just do it this way a little bit. Okay. Is that a better shot for you guys? This is called the mount. It means one hand and one leg on each side. I've purchased a good width and breadth of real estate, but I also present to her a hand and a hand and a knee and a knee that she can start to attach to and control. So when I was growing up in jujitsu, as a jujitsu baby, I was taught, you know, when I was in my jujitsu childhood, I was taught that. The mount is the most superior position in jiu-jitsu. We can debate this offline, or we can debate it right here. But I no longer believe that. I believe that the side mount is far superior to the mount. And the reason I've come to believe that is because there's less of you available for the person on the bottom to attack or attach to when you side mount. You can also focus your weight much more intensely from the side mount. You can also transition more easily to multiple positions from the side mount. So I have become a huge proponent of side mount only. And here's how this works. When I'm taking the side mount position, an individual can have their elbows in against their rib cage. And when the individual keeps their elbows in against their rib cage, they keep a frame or a wedge in place, which helps them to control or disperse my weight. So for example, if I put my chest on their chest, that's fine. But when I start to lengthen my legs behind me so that all of the weight from my body touches less of the mat and more of them, 
and centers exclusively in the mid-range of their body, in their diaphragm, in their guts, and I separate the body into northern and southern hemispheres like we talked about last week, now this becomes really problematic. One of the ways they can relieve that pressure is look what she's doing right here. She framed the hip, and because she keeps the elbow on the ground, and because she cups her hand, like we talked about last week, and palms the hip, she can essentially float me and relieve a little pressure, right? Now, she can help herself by adding a second frame. These two right angles are very powerful. She'll float my hips on the low frame, and she'll float my head or chest on the high frame. Again, notice how she's not grabbing. She doesn't need to hold the gi and squeeze the cloth. What will that do other than maybe help you develop your grip? But it won't do anything. Why squeeze the cloth and waste the energy? Cup the hand, find the natural hold in the shoulder, find the, find the natural hold in the hip, and then the forearm becomes a frame. The top half of the arm between the elbow and the shoulder remains bent so that, I'm sorry, that remains straight. The forearm and, and the elbow remain bent so that there is a 90 degree bend in the arm. It's a very powerful, structure and you can see here I can just float on her and she's tolerating that and I weigh like 290 <laughs> so well, I think I weigh like 212 right now I was like there's no way you weigh yeah it's not in, right it's not <laughs> I'm not Tony I'm not Johnny Utah it's not insignificant right it's not insignificant um 212 is not a lightweight I don't know what I am right now it's between 208 and 212 anyway 212 pounds sitting directly on your diaphragm is not comfortable. The wedges can help her, right? So the first thing I need to do to be able to control from the side mount is start to pick up her defense system. The defense system is structural. She's got a heavy frame, a heavy frame set up against my hips and the same load bearing frame set up against my chin. So in order to remove the bottom frame, I'm still keeping my hands on the mat for a little bit of base, but I'm trying to drop my hips into the hips to immediately on her diaphragm, right? Because my leg is long, she's able to push and fill the space in the hips. So what I'll do now is shorten my leg. I'll bend my leg and try to touch my kneecap to her rib cage close to her hip. And then when this happens, I can slide my knee open and wedge open her arm, all right? If she would turn a little bit this way, what's happening is my leg is long back here and I make it short by bending my knee. And when I touch her rib cage, I take my knee against her elbow and I wedge it open. And then I stick my knee directly into the armpit, okay? Now in order to keep the arm from closing, in order to keep the arm from closing, she's wedged. I'm my bottom hand, that means the hand closest to her feet, goes under her armpit. And now I turn my hands into a gable grip. A gable grip means I place my palms together with my hands in a cross, and then I fold the fingers and fold the fingers. Now, if you choose to put power into this grip, you'll be sacrificing weight and power that you could be putting into them, right? Gable grips are just a way of securing your position. You're not supposed to squeeze this as hard as you can and burn out your arms, burn out your fingers, burn out your grips. All of your extra energy is supposed to focus on her. I need to nail her to the mat across her center line. I need to impact her diaphragm so that she can't appropriately oxygenate her lungs. I need to put pressure on her internal organs to make her uncomfortable. I also need to restrict mobility in the area of her body that matters most. As we discussed last week, anytime a person wants to activate a defensive measure, one of the first things they will typically do is create space with their hips or get close with their hips. And they do that by way of what we call shrimping, where the hips slide out or shoot in. If there's a huge 212 pound weight sitting on those hips, perhaps they can move the hips, but the motion will be slowed. And by restricting or slowing that motion, I have more time than she does in my top control position to manage her defensive attempts and continue to pick off 
the little insertions that she's making, which take away my element of control. So we're still actually getting a full purchase of all of the real estate on the top, bottom, near and far sides of her body. But because the majority of our bodies are hanging off like an outrigger on a Tahitian canoe, we end up exerting and exhibiting more control in a precise fashion. You see if Charlene is laying on her back, we'll ask her again to put her head near the camera. Right, when Charlene is laying on her back and I mount her, David Adams, what's up? Although I've purchased real estate on the top half and on the bottom half, and although I'm left and right of her, and although I can place my weight down in her hips by pushing my hips forward and putting my feet together like this, I'm still more reachable. She can still touch the arm. She can still touch the tricep. She can still trap the foot. And she still has enough hip mobility that if she lifts her hips in a bridge, uh-oh, that was a really cool special effect on Facebook, um, <laughs> right? As she lifts her hips, I'm tilted. I lose my base, I, I compromise my base. Whereas the superiority, the, the superiority of the side mount in relationship to the mount is, is thus, is such that I'm still purchasing real estate on the top half of her body and I'm controlling her head. This is important because, let me show you a little example here. If Charlene wants to shrimp away from me, look where she's looking, she's looking at me. Wherever she looks, her hips go away from that side. That's because her spine cannot be restricted, and if it is restricted, it impacts her ability to maintain hip mobility. So when she comes back to me on a flat back, just a little experiment here you can do with your partner. I think we have to move closer. Uh, I mean, farther away again. Right? A little experiment you can do with your partner is take their chin here and have them look the other way. Now I'm gonna ask her to shrimp over there it's a lot harder, right? Her, her spine <laughs> stays glued to the mat, it stays flat. And without her spine coming off the mat and turning, she doesn't have the option to insert the knee and elbow between uh, her body and mine and create the space she needs to complete her escape. That's why, in fact, that's the purpose of her making this wedge in the first place. The reason she frames the hips is so that she can hold me still at the hip, hold me still at the shoulder, bridge into me and look at me, and now she shrimps. And look at all the space that she created here. She didn't create the space, this is critical. She did not create the space because she pushed me away. She created the space because she held me still, looked at me, and then took her hips out. She moved herself, not me. She moved herself, not me. This matters very much. Because if I understand that that is the process by which an individual extricates themselves from the side mount, I can pick apart the pieces of their side mount defense early enough that despite their attempts to move themselves away, I remain connected, right? So the first element that we remove is the frame that's closest to us. Just so we get the anatomy of the side mount correct, this is top, because the head is at the top of the body. This is bottom because the feet are at the bottom of the body. This is near because this is the side that I'm closest to her on. And that's far because that's the farthest side away. So we have top, bottom, near, far. So in this top, bottom, near, far construction, I'm still purchasing 360 degrees of real estate, but I'm gluing her to the mat with all of the pressure in my hips. And that means that the more of me that's on her, the heavier I am, the more of me that's on the mat, if I touch the mat with both hands, if I bend my knees, if I try to put my weight on her chest, I'm, I'm not putting the weight on her diaphragm where it needs to be. As opposed to weight on the diaphragm, knees off the mat, hands off the mat. Now, Charlene is grimacing, I feel bad so I had to stop, <laughs> but it's not comfortable, right? It's not comfortable. The one thing that may help her here is this little frame in the hip. And then the second thing that will help her is this little frame in the neck. And even with these two right angle load bearing frames, she can support a lot of my weight comfortably. So I need to take at least one of them away. I'm gonna work with what's closest to me first. The elbow that's on the ground, that's on the near side is closest to me. So I'll straighten a leg, put the knee in, 
reach back to the rib cage with the knee and then spread my base open and wedge that frame out of the way. Now that the frame is out of the way, I can concentrate on securing the other top half of her, which means the hand goes under the head. Now one advantage of the hand being under the head is remember that in order to shrimp away and affect her escape, she needs to look at me. But as she looks at me, I can take my shoulder, dig a little deep and roll her chin away, which makes it very difficult for her to look at me. And because she can't look at me, it makes it very difficult for her to shrimp away. A little closer. It's really hard to stay on camera. This is like the biggest challenge <laughs> is just staying in camera. Framing. Framing. We need a cinematographer in here. I don't know. I don't know what we need. <laughs> right, I've wedged open the elbow. I'm under the head. Now, this hand is not trying to grab her and squeeze. If you squeeze here, all I'm doing is giving my buddy Charlene a big hug. And we do that anyway, because we love each other. Hey, Sundar, hey, Charlene, I love you. I'm gonna hug you, jujitsu bros, right? Okay, that's not really helping the jujitsu here. That's just exhibiting friendship. No friendship, I hate this person. I need to destroy and kill them. Isn't that the competitive mindset? Isn't that why we all train so we can hurt people? I think so. Wanna hurt as many people as possible. So to inflict as much pain as possible on Charlene, I need to attack where she's vulnerable. She's vulnerable in her midsection. She's vulnerable in her diaphragm. That means that the hand under the head is just a placeholder to keep the wedge under the armpit tight. And now the second hand is gonna touch the hips at the, at the low point and then join hands with the hand on top and I'm gonna make a gay ball. I'm not gonna squeeze, I'm just gonna connect. Now that I've got everything purchased, top, bottom, near, and far, when I stretch my legs and put all my weight on her, this sucks. So I'm gonna take a little bit of weight off so we can talk. But that sucks, all right? And what will happen is this hand still in the neck will be the one place she has left to push, and she'll start to push, 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 and as she pushes, it makes my head high. That's great, because now I can hold the shoulder, and taking my free hand, tap the hand across, and then put my head back down, right, on the other side of the arm. Now it's even worse for her. Not only is she being crushed by 212 pounds in her diaphragm, in her intestines, not only is her head being forced to look away so she can't shrimp, not only are the hips being contained here by the elbow, but she also has her own arm stuck across her face. How much worse can it get? I'll show you. <laughs> Thanks for asking, right? We're gonna keep this contained. Remember, if I lift my head, the arm goes away. So once she frames me and I push the arm across, I relieve the tension on the arm by lifting my chin. I bury my head with my forehead on my hands. As close as possible. Now the trick is to walk to the other side. Now you see, she's done something here. This is a very classic wall building defense. Many, many people in classical jiu-jitsu, Charlene and I come from essentially the same jiu-jitsu lineage. We are both people who, um, were trained from our inception in the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu system. And the, the classical Gracie Jiu-Jitsu system is very self-defense oriented. It's very methodical, it's very geometric. And so it relies more on shapes than it does linear techniques. It relies more on principles than it does details. This principle here, where she's built a self-defense wall, is a way for her to control and add another frame or wedge into the mix. See, if the legs are flat, I can just like whoop, and climb right over top, right? Or if the legs are flat or open, I can just boop, slide a knee right across the middle. But when the individual starts to put their foot on their opposite leg and turns their knee in a little bit, it's yet another thing that I have to deal with, okay? So we're gonna talk about how to get through this and then advance ourselves to the other side. Remember, in the very beginning, she's wedging the hips and wedging the neck and so before I start to exhibit my pressure, I stretch the leg that's closest to her head, spin the knee toward her hips, shoot the knee back inside so that I can spread my knee open and flare her arm. That removes the hip wedge. Once this is done, the head is the next natural thing to grab. And I don't squeeze here and waste power. I simply insert another obstacle. Now that that obstacle has been inserted, my second hand, bottom side, far side hand, touches the hip, and the goal is to keep her from running away. 
Remember that if she wants to run away, she looks at me. Because only by looking the head that, that way at me can she take the hips away from me. So I'm gonna use my shoulder and put a little pressure in her neck and draw the head in the same direction as the hips. It's very difficult. Now, try this at home. Lay on your back, look your head to your left, and escape your hips to your right. Easy, right? Now, look your head to your left and escape your hips to your left. Much harder. Your movement is restricted. Now, imagine if that's done under pressure. The elbow here contains the hips. I will join my hands in a gable grip just to lock things in place, but the goal is not to squeeze. The goal is to contain these upper apparatus, apparati, I believe, Kim can correct me. It sounds like an architectural term. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan can correct me with his masterful Latin. And the sole frame that she has remaining is the wedge in my neck. And that's a significant frame because it's touching my throat. The throat's very vulnerable. So when I start to put pressure on her by, st by stepping my knees off the mat, that means I go to a long leg here on my toes, and I go to a flat foot near the head. Now she's going to wet, ugh, right? There's a little bit of uncomfortability here. So I'll take a little relief and push the hand across the body, and then immediately dive my head as low as possible. My goal is to wedge my own ear now under her shoulder so she can't pull the arm back, and I'll rejoin my hands. Now you'll see she'll, she's still got this wall built here on the bottom half of the side mount, so we'll turn this way now. How's that? Okay. She's out the wall, and I'm in my classic position. In order to get past the wall, remember how when she had the elbow close to the ribcage, I stretched my knee, put my knee in, shot it back, and then opened, and I established? Okay, I need to do the same thing here. I'm going to turn the knee in a little bit, put it close. Now my hands can go flat, and as they go flat, my knee can go to the stomach. All right, my knee can go to the stomach. This is another classic position from the top side mount called Jueo Nobahiga. Jueo Nobahiga means Jueo is knee and Na is in the or on the, and the Bahiga is the belly. So we call it knee on belly. It's very dominant. It puts a lot of pressure in the midsection, the same kind of pressure that I had when I was putting my hips in her midsection. But the goal here is to transition to the other side seamlessly. Now, without touching my hands, this is what the leg and footwork will look like. I'll turn my hip in, shoot the knee, spread it open, and then put the knee in the stomach. And I'm going to walk across until my knee touches the ground. See, this leg remains behind. And as I dismount with my lead leg, my second leg fills the space. You see? All I'm doing is switching to an opposite side knee on belly. The easiest way to demo this might be with the partner's legs flat. And I'd start with my lead leg in the belly. And with my hands flat, I'd flip this one off and then close there. Flip this one off and then close there. Right, and we're just gonna go back and forth like that. And make Charlene as uncomfortable as possible. So as we are dismounting the lead leg, Ooh, Brian, hey, honey, I see you. <laughs> as, we're, as we're dismounting with the lead leg, the second leg is tracking and filling the space that's left behind, right? This is very effective when I want to move from a top controlled side mount position into a mount position, because if you're a competitor, you care about advancing the mount position because that gives you four points. Right? And, all we, and, and as we all know, medals are more important than anything. It doesn't matter if you, you know, win a fight or can actually do jiu-jitsu in real life. All that matters is you got a gold at Naga. Duh. Good job. It's all about the belts. <laughs> it's all about the belts and the medals. Okay. So really, though, for the competitors, if you're looking to play a point strategy, when you're in the side mount, if you're not able to immediately submit, you'll want to advance to the mount so you can gain points. I don't know what the current point system is for knee and belly. Perhaps it's three points. I think it's three. But if you can get to the knee and belly position from a classical side mount and hold that for three to four seconds, you'll be awarded three points. Then if you can transition the knee on belly into a full mount, that's an additional four points. So with these two chained together movements, you've gained seven points. Congrats, you're winning. Okay. Classical side mount position. We've already opened the elbow, we've held the head. 
We'd stretch the legs and step up on the lead leg, and I'd join the hands. This little wall down here that she's building is an issue. So we'll tilt the knee in and then put the knee back so we put pressure on the leg, you see? We're putting a little pressure on the leg to create some space. And into that space, instead of trying to face her and put the knee in the belly this way, I'm just gonna slide up backwards. We're just gonna do this. You see, I have a nice base. My knee is across the midsection. It's a little bit pointed toward her shoulder. To get heavy now, I take my toes off the mat. And that sucks, right? The hand is flat. And then from this position, if I want to get all the way to the other side, I would flip the lead leg off and then follow with the second leg to switch sides. If I want to mount, I'll come from over here now toward you. If I want to mount, I would do this. I'd back up to remove the wedge, or at least to take away a little bit of her wall building, where she places her foot on her opposite knee. The hands go to the mat. I sit my hips right up into the knee and belly. Now I walk across to this side, and when my knee touches the ground, I'm going to try to push my hips south. You see? Now remember, the initial hand position is under the arm and under the head. If I keep this position while I am transitioning from here to knee, and I slide my knee across until it touches the mat, I'll push the knee south and push the arm north. Look at all the space that makes. If I close up the space here, the more she can connect her knee and elbow, the more she defends, you see? So I need to be under, and I'm gonna push the knee south and push the arms north. Now look, I'm just gonna flip the foot off, and as I do, I step up on the other side because I need to bring my opposite heel close to her hip. If I don't bring the opposite heel close to the hip, she pushes the leg and escapes. See, she's already got me in a half guard position because I left the second leg unsecured. Here's what it looks like from the back. I'm under the arm, sorry, under the head. I'm under the armpit. I turn a little bit, sit to the knee and belly. I'm starting to walk across. I push the knee south and the arms north. Now if I just flip off and leave my foot exposed, she pushes it between her legs, and I'm in half guard. I haven't successfully mounted, so I don't get the points. Or I don't get the dominant position, even though our original argument is that side mount is better than mount. Right, so what I need to do when I flip the foot is quickly connect my trailing heel to her hip so there's no space for her to recover. Under the head, I've taken the elbow out of the way, under the far arm, gable grip. If she builds this wall right here, and I'm already in a heavy side mount, I can dip the knee in a little bit, shoot it close, and now I'm gonna sit backwards. I'm gonna sort of scoot into position here, and then keep my hand under the armpit. When I get to the other side, I'm gonna walk my hand high, walk my hand high, and then put my knee south. Now watch this leg this time. When I flip the knee and belly off her body, this leg shoots to the hip. You see, now she can't feed the leg to her own legs. And then to finish, I simply slide my dismounted knee from the knee and belly back to the armpit and walk flat. And I'm mounted. Okay. So that's a mount transition from top side mount, considering all of the classic controls in place, where I pick apart her frame piece by piece. We do some waving. Robert Weber, Judge Robert Weber, uh, former Marine, although you're never really a former Marine, Edward Duplessis from the Poconos. Um, great Krav Maga school out there. Jiu-Jitsu guys too. Mike Mata, a favorite Italian. Okay. I got a hard cut off. I gotta get to a What's that? I got a hard cut off. I gotta get to a meeting. Okay. Charlene's out. Great class, y'all.
So here's what I want you to notice. When we're controlling the side mount and she uses the frame in the neck and we take the tension off the head and push the frame across the neck and bury our head on the other side. Obviously, if we walk fully to the other side, you will discover an arm triangle there. Okay, that's what you'll discover. If you don't get there, the goal is to keep all of her wedges open. Don't let her reclose her knee and elbow. Don't let her connect her elbow back to the rib cage. Don't let her knee and elbow connect to one another. You must separate all of the elements of the person's body that are in your way. And once you separate them, you must keep them away from one another to the extent that you dominate the space. The sole purpose of the side mount is to wear the individual out. You must exhaust them. And the way you exhaust them is by putting consistent pressure on their diaphragm, right? The body works that the hips are the midline. Everything above the hips is Northern Hemisphere. Everything below the hips is Southern Hemisphere. If you allow the whole Northern and Southern Hemisphere to work together, bye. Okay. Zoom is cutting off in 10 minutes. Facebook goes forever. Okay, uh, if, if you allow the whole system to work together, if you allow the whole North and South to work cooperatively, this is getting game of, games of throny here, but if you allow the North and South to work together cooperatively, then that unification creates a good deal of, of uh, power. So I need to separate pieces of the body out. I need to put pressure across the midline so that the North is separated from the South. Maybe it's getting civil war -y. And once that happens, I'm actually looking to, to create a conflict between the two. I want the north section, the top half of the opponent's body, struggling without assistance from the south to fend off the attack. And I want the, south, the southern half of the body, the legs and the feet, to be struggling to move the hips all the while independently functioning of the north. And because those two things aren't working in tandem, it makes for really bad jujitsu for the defender. And because they're doing bad jujitsu, and if, if, if the jujitsu from the top position is, is superior, then you've won. It's really not a contest of what position beats what. Is gi better than no gi? These are all such small minded questions. And frankly, we have a lot of incredibly small minded people in the jujitsu community. I wish it wasn't the case. I, my, my, my personal mission in jujitsu is to get you to think more about jujitsu, to think more deeply about jujitsu. I personally suck at actually doing jujitsu but I'm hopeful that I can inspire people to think more deeply about jujitsu. That's the goal here. Think about the body that you're attacking as having a top half and a bottom half. You cut that in half right at the center line, and how do you keep it cut? You put something on it. Put as much pressure and weight as you can throughout the entire section, right? That means hand under the head on top to keep the shoulder looking away. I'll start to keep their head looking away. Hand near the hip on the far side, gable grip. Now, if I leave my hips up, there's no pressure. So I drop my hips into the person, right? I drop the hips into the person's diaphragm to make them struggle. Not only does it separate north and south, it impacts their breathing severely. And then they start to respond in emergency crisis management fashion. They try to throw in a wedge near my hip. I take that away, how? With the knee, right? They try to throw in a wedge near my head. I take that away how? I tap it and put the head low and regrip and keep the arm stuck on the other side. If at that point I then walk to the other side and sit next to them, you'll see this position show up. Most guys who do judo would call it a keisha gatami position or a scarf hold position. And I could walk myself with a little bit of squeezing and a low head into a very successful arm triangle. Other than that, the submission anywhere will only ever be a consequence of a perfect position. We, we hear this mantra, position before submission, but we don't really think about what it means. We just go, yeah, yeah, position before submission. And then who does it? But nobody does it, right? Except the people who actually understand how to get submissions and understand that submission is the last thing that happens in a long chain. If the submission is the finish, right? You've finished him, finished her, finished the opponent, then you only got there because you began at the beginning, went through the middle, and arrived at the end. If you've gotten to the end without a beginning and a middle, I don't know how you did that, you're a wizard, but you had to walk through a process to make the submission effective. 
This is the point. Allow the submission to arrive based on the good, strong position you've built. We're gonna stop here. If you have questions, hit us up in the comments. Thanks to Charlene Dixon for all of the amazing assistance and support. Thanks to the compound, BJJ, Muay Thai, Silver Spring, and its owners, Pal Sikachan and Rita June Sikachan, for allowing us to do this every Monday and Friday at 12.15. And we will see you guys in person, on the mat very soon. I know everyone's staying healthy, doing their thing. Train if you can, get together, be safe, be healthy. We look forward to seeing you again soon.